In today's video, we are going to talk all about your assumptions about family nurse practitioners. We'll kind of go over like, are they true and false? There probably will be little tangents. It's gonna be a good time. If you're new here, welcome, I'm Liz. I am a family nurse practitioner, which I feel allows me to talk about all the things you assume about it, which some of them were very accurate and some of them I was like, ah, hurtful. But anyway, that's the authority that I have to discuss this in case you needed to know. Before we start jumping into all these assumptions, I did wanna thank Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. In case you're not familiar with them, Skillshare is an online learning platform that over 7 million people use to learn about new things and build their creativity and develop new skills. They have over 25,000 different videos that teach you things in topics like business, design, how to talk to people. The topics are really quite endless. For example, I just checked out a video on how to make delicious coffee. It was called From Plant to Cup how to brew an amazing cup of coffee. And it kind of walked you through the steps of, you know, like I should probably buy whole beans and then grind them myself, which I do have a grinder, so I could do. And then, you know, do the pour over thing and it would bring me joy and apparently be way more delicious than what I'm currently making, which could be helpful to you because if you're watching this, you're probably a nurse or an NP school or something that you need coffee. Everyone needs coffee. Are you a human? Then you need coffee and this can help. You can gain access to this video as well as all their other ones on their platform for an annual subscription of less than $10 a month. Or to start off with, you can go to the link in my description box and get two months for free. So go check that out. Like I said, I'll leave it right at the top of my description box because whether you are looking to fuel your curiosity, creativity, or just try to learn how to make a really good cup of coffee, Skillshare is the perfect place to learn and grow in 2019. Now let's get into these assumptions. All right, I assume you would see a lot of the same things. So this is actually, I would say the opposite of true. I think family practice, if you guys follow me over on Instagram, I do, I show you at the end of the day, kind of a rundown of what I saw that day. Um, and we always do a little bit of teaching about what I learned that day or things that I think might be helpful for you. But I, you can kind of see like there's just a huge array of things like, yes, physicals can get repetitive because the preventative care is very similar, but I would say like only a quarter of my day or less is usually a physical. Other than that, it's people coming in with every complaint under the sun. Um, even though the main diagnoses are very common, like the chronic conditions you're managing, like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, you see those all the time. You can kind of, every patient's approach to it is different and you can teach about it in a different way. Uh, and like I said, the acute complaints are all over the board. I mean, people go to their primary care provider with every little thing you could imagine. So obviously it doesn't get too boring, I feel like, because A, the people are so different. There's just so many different personalities. And they're so, I mean, if you think about what primary care does is they do preventative health, they do acute treatment, they're filling out all your like crazy forms that you have, answering your questions about like you traveling to weird countries. What disease is this that you got there and what vaccines do you need? It's just a huge scope. So I would say the opposite of that is true. Um, I see a lot of not the same things, which is part of what makes it really challenging. Okay, family nurse practitioners are underestimated in healthcare. Yeah, let's go with that. As with all things, there are really good ones and really not good ones. Uh, just like there's really good physicians and really not good ones, you know? But I'll go with most of us are underestimated. I think one thing family nurse practitioners do have is with your nursing background, you just have such a strong focus on like connecting with patients and patient education, which you did a lot as a nurse. And I think that translates really well into a provider role. So I think that's one thing that I do think people underestimate is your ability to connect with people and get them to kind of trust you by listening to them and form a relationship and help them and educate them and empower them. All right, next. NPs don't make as much money as everyone says. So I don't know what everyone says. I feel like social media, I've talked about this a lot, does really glamorize a lot of like nursing and NP and show these like crazy lifestyles that, you know, for Instagram that are probably um, either one that they can't afford or just like not realistic. I would say, I mean, if you look, nurse, family nurse practitioners usually make between like really low end, like 80, 85, I would say much more in the 100 range, all the way up to like 130, you know, depending where you live and what you kind of setting you work in. Most of my friends make about 100 as new grads. So I don't really know where that falls in line with what you were thinking, how much they get paid. But I do agree that sometimes the lifestyle can be like blown up and shown as like super glamorous. And I think that's just like Instagram. Be an Instagram. The worst part is dealing with insurance companies. So, 
sort of true. The worst part is not being able to provide care to patients when you know like this will fix you and you can't do that A because their insurance company says no or they don't have insurance or they have to meet their deductible with their insurance company. So I guess, yeah, the worst part is the insurance companies. Um, when people can't afford their care, that is the worst part. They can't do what you need that, what you all know would be the best for them because they can't afford it. That is heartbreaking and awful. It gets boring and repetitive, kind of like we talked with before. It doesn't get too boring. There's always new stuff that you're seeing. There are definitely, cold and flu season gets so boring and repetitive, no lies, because uh, everyone's coming in, they're like, I've coughed twice, and like, I have a little bit of a fever, and my nose is running. <laughs> you get really bored with that spiel, like over and over. But the rest of the year is a lot less so. All you do is chart, there's no balance. This, there is a lot of charting. I would say I spend almost as much time charting as I do with patients. That's I'm getting better about charting in the room, so that's kind of tipping that balance but there is a ton of charting and paperwork. If you wanna see kind of a day in the life and what all the charting is that goes into it, I'll leave a video down, link down below uh, where I like take you to work with me and you can kind of see some of what I'm talking about. I wouldn't say it's all charting and there's no balance, but it is a lot of charting and at least half, I mean at least probably like half of your patient contact is charting, which stinks. And that's the same in nursing. Um, you just spend so much time charting. It totally stinks. There's a lot of failure to keep the number of drugs to a minimum. This is very true. It is very difficult to convince patients to come off of medications and it really should be a shared decision-making thing, you know, where you're educating them, hey, this medicine might be doing more harm than good at this point. There is usually symptom return if you take a medicine away and most patients don't wanna deal with that. And it can be really overwhelming when they come to you and they're on like literally 15 or 20 meds and you're like, oh my gosh, like how do I even start to wheedle this down? And they're seeing specialists who just keep giving them more or like changing it. And it's kind of your job as the primary care provider to hug all the, like gather all the data and try to get things down. And it's a difficult balance too because their symptoms might return. So, you know, I don't wanna take you off this and then have you have a stroke because you got a blood clot. That is a challenging balance. Some patients get mad at you that they don't get better but didn't follow instructions. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> people would like a pill for everything this is again not across the board at all there are some patients who are you know very like oh you want like this would get me better perfect let's go for it but there are definitely those that would like a pill for everything and when you offer them lifestyle modification first or like tell them hey you have to take your metformin for your diabetes to be better controlled and then they don't do it and then they're mad at you somehow that does happen you are overworked and underpaid <laughs> I guess it depends on where you work. I feel like my job, I made a very conscious effort when I was interviewing to make sure I had like admin time to chart while I was at work and that there wouldn't be, you know, like every 15 minute appointments for the whole, whole time I'm there when there's no downtime and like I'm expected to be on call and seeing patients in nursing homes. I have read horror stories of people who are, you know, like charting for hours at home because they don't have admin time at work. They're getting paid like an okay-ish, but not stellar salary. They're doing nursing home days on the weekends and they're taking call. And it's like, no. When you're going into the job process, just be very, like if you're gonna do all those extra things, you should be making a lot of money. But I think scheduling like boundaries between work and home is huge. And being upfront in the interview process about that. Like I literally said, I want my home time to be home time. And she was like, yeah, I agree. Like find somewhere if you can that kind of values that. And you get that through admin time. So when you are interviewing, that's my biggest tip is ask for admin time where you can get your charting and your paperwork done. And if you will be taking call, do you get paid extra for that? Because if you're not getting paid extra, you shouldn't be doing a ton of call, like once a month, twice a month, okay. But if you're doing call all the time and you're not getting paid for it, hmm, concerning. You always feel like you're drowning at work. In the beginning, yes. So I just hit my one year mark and um, in the beginning I did feel like I was just drowning. But now that is getting a lot better. Now that I have some things that are on autopilot, now that I know some things, I don't have to look every single little thing up. When you have to look everything up because you're new, you feel like you're drowning. But now that I've gotten more into it, I don't. And I've gotten a lot better systems management down for like, this is when I will check messages. Before it was like every time a new message popped up, I was like, oh, I have to address it like right away. Now I know like, 
you know, I've kind of worked with my MAs to be like, they can filter through some of them, or I know I check my messages when I get there in the beginning and then when I leave and everything in between, like they can come and tell me, the MAs, if they're like, oh, this is urgent. But I've kind of like gotten better systems down to just handle all the different influxes of information that are thrown at you as well as gotten a lot better with the charting system and a lot better at kind of navigating patients' appointments. I can kind of wrap things up a little bit better than I could in the beginning. I've learned some new verbiage. Um, it just, you streamline it over time. So I don't usually feel like I'm drowning now, but in the beginning I definitely did. So it's normal if you're feeling like you're drowning, it'll get better. You have to know a little bit of everything, yes. <laughs> so this is part of what makes family practice very challenging is because, and I just remember this from studying for boards, was there was just so much information. like so much. If you think everything goes through kind of primary care and you're expected to have like some answers about like everything from like, oh, my elbow is aching to what's this weird mole look like? My tongue has these weird dots. I think my hair is all falling out. Is this toenail fungus? What vaccines do I need? What preventative screen? There's just a lot. <laughs> There's a lot, but it's fun. I love it. You can now be a primary care provider to all your friends and family. No, please don't do that. <laughs> That's not a good idea. Depending on, I think, where you live, the legality of it, but ethically, it is frowned upon um, because you are not objective and you always wanna be objective. Personally, I would never write anything for my friends and family just because I would not want, what if I did something wrong? I couldn't live with that. And I'm not objective, you know? <laughs> I'm not gonna be, they, you need to have a, an objective healthcare provider and you are not that. It is not worth it because of the small increase in pay compared to being a registered nurse. Depending on where you live, the pay difference could be like crazy or not that big. I make $11 an hour more than I did when I was a registered nurse. So that gives you a little bit of a frame of reference. I'm not everyone, obviously. Some people make a lot more, but let me just say, do not become a nurse practitioner for the money. <laughs> Don't do it. It's a huge jump in responsibility. It is quite stressful. It leads to a lot of burnout unless you really, really love it because like some of the other responses have said, there's just so much that goes into it. Um, there's a lot of charting. There's a lot of, it's just, it can be a really draining job if you don't love it. Um, I really, really love what I do. And that keeps me going through the times that I'm like, why did I, what have I done? Cause there are definitely days like that. And if you're just doing it for the money, there are so many more ways to make money as a nurse versus going back to an MP. Like if you wanna go into management as a nurse, if you wanna you know, become a supervisor or go up the ranks that way, if all you are doing it for is the money, do not become a nurse practitioner. You will burn out. You will not like it. That's my soapbox. You have to deal with dramatic family dynamics that spill into appointments. You actually deal with this a lot less than when you were a nurse. When I was a nurse, there was a lot of family drama, a lot of security being called, there was just, it was a lot. As an FNP now, there's less. I mean, people for sure tell you about their drama, but it's much easier to redirect it. Um, usually their whole family's not showing them with them with to the appointment. I mean, if they do, that's a whole, whole separate issue. But usually it's just like them, maybe them and like their partner or them and their kid. You know, it's, it's not the whole family that's in your room like when you're a nurse and you're just like, wow, there's a lot of drama here. You can redirect things a lot easier in an office. You get sick a lot. Actually, I have not gotten sick a lot at all. I got sick a lot more as a nurse, probably because you're just all up in people's grill all the time who are like really, really sick. And those hospital bugs are hardcore. Um, I got like one or two colds last year, but I really didn't get too sick. Hand washing is your friend, Purell. I probably Purell too much. I feel like I like have that from my nursing days. I Purell when I walk in the room, during the encounter, after I touch them, before I leave, they're probably like, why, why do you think I'm so gross? Insurance companies dictate and alter many of the choices related to your patient care. Yes, I cannot tell you how many times I'm looking at the updated evidence-based guidelines and it's like, do this, and then you order that, and the insurance company's like, no, they have to fail all these old methods that don't really work, but they have to fail them all before you try the actual one that we know will work. Insurance companies dictate a lot of your care. Sometimes I'm like, I don't understand why I went to school because apparently you know everything even though you didn't go to school. <laughs> I could have just gone and like worked for you and could have told people how to live their lives. Fine, not better. It requires more knowledge, but the job is easier than a bedside nurse. So it requires different knowledge and a different type of hard. It's like physically hard than when I was a bedside nurse. I mean, like you are so active there. It requires obviously like very just different knowledge. So I feel like I do, I guess, know, I understand more of the whole picture, but as a nurse too, I like, I don't know. I wouldn't say one has more or less. The provider role is you have a lot 
like a more stepped back bigger picture whereas as a nurse you had so many details about the minute tiny little things because you were seeing a slightly smaller picture you weren't worrying about like the overarching treatment plans and how everything interacts quite as much but i don't know if you know like less as a nurse your, your knowledge is just very different fmps don't need to work or collaborate with doctors as much as pas do i would say that's false um the when i so I haven't ever worked with a PA that's like fresh out of school, but I have worked with several PAs who are, you know, established in their career five, 10 years in, and they performed collaboration very similarly to how a nurse practitioner does. If you have questions, like you go, but that's more of like a colleague thing. Like, hey, can I just run this by you? In my experience, at least from what I've seen, there really is not, was not a huge difference. But like I said, I've never seen a PA directly out of school. I feel like the only disadvantage there would be like a family practice PA has not had all of their training in family medicine, whereas a nurse practitioner, an FNP has had all their training in family medicine. So in the beginning period, maybe the PA would ask more questions, but a few years into it, I would anticipate the relationship to look very, very similar. You can work in most specialties. So this, you can work in most outpatient specialties without any issues. I have friends in derm, cardiology, um, nephrology, the, I would probably say stay away from psych since there are psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners who that is what they do. Um, and this is actually ever changing. I know in some states, insurance companies are starting to get kind of picky about who they let work in specialties saying FNPs were not trained in this, so you can't do it. But that's in some states, I think that's going to, where it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out. But in most states you can work in an outpatient specialty. Inpatient, it gets a little bit dicey for FNPs. Your degree was very expensive. So I paid 37-ish grand, I think. It was $1,000 per credit hour, which was fairly reasonable. I went to a state school, so that kept my costs down a lot. Family nurse practitioners cannot write prescriptions. False, that is what I do most of the day. So as a family nurse practitioner, you can assess, diagnose, and treat which means you can write prescriptions. And if you have your DEA license, you can write scheduled medications, so controlled substances. There are lots of paperwork and insurance issues. Yes, yes there are. FNPs work five days a week, nine to five. I'd be kissing my 312s goodbye. So some work that schedule, I obviously work part-time. Some of my, my friends seem to be split into working 410s, which is pretty sweet, or nine to five. Some of them work part-time, like they work just like three days a week. Some of them work three full days and a half day. So it kind of varies. Um, the only friends I have that got 312s work in urgent cares. FMPs aren't as good or competent because they aren't actual doctors. So I think as long as you know your scope and know that you can't manage the craziest of the crazy, especially right out of school. As a family nurse practitioner, I feel like I can do a lot of things really well. And then there are sometimes those patients, I'm just like, this is outside of my comfort zone and knowing when to hand them over. I think it gets scary sometimes when family nurse practitioners try to just do it all. And that's just not why we exist. You know what I mean? Like internal medicine physicians have gone to school for so, so, so much longer. So they should handle the super complex ones. So I think that is a line that you just need to be really self aware of. And I know some people won't like that answer. Um, but knowing where your boundaries are and knowing when to say like, this is a little bit beyond me. I'm going to hand it over to you who has a bit more experience and like training. But at the same time, you can do what you do really, really well. And when I say like, I can't see everything, I'm saying nine out of 10 people that are at our office, I feel like I can manage very competently. And then there's the one out of every 10 that's just like, whoa, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, and just being really honest with yourself about what you can handle, what you feel comfortable handling and what you should handle. Um, and then letting someone else handle the ones that are a little bit wild. But I do think that as an FNP, I can very competently provide care to those other nine out of 10 in a very safe way. An FNP is more of a doctor than a nurse. I mean, you're assuming the provider role. So I think it's a nice mix though, because I think you still have that nursing aspect is always going to be part of your background and part of who you are. And I think I see differently. I see things differently sometimes than the physician I work with and she sees things differently than I do. So we kind of mesh well because we bring very different perspectives to it, but you are assuming a lot of those responsibilities of a provider. So it does change in that way. And you lose some of the hands-on like one-on-one -on -one time that you had as a nurse, because that's a huge, awesome thing about being a nurse is you have that one-on-one -on -one 
connection that can get lost when you know you're trying to stay on schedule and see all these people. And the last one is working as an FMP is less stressful than as a nurse working inpatient. I think honestly working as an FMP is more stressful. Working inpatient for me as a nurse, and it might just be, I don't know if it's the job or if it's my experience. So I had done that for a really long time. So that was very like in my groove, I was very comfortable with it. So it was not stressful for me really at all working inpatient as a nurse, whereas this is still fairly new, but it's also stress. So I don't know if it's stressful because of that or because I'm more responsible for people's lives. Um, I'm in charge of your healthcare and that is a big responsibility. Um, it is stressful. So I don't know, I think working as an FMP is more stressful than working in patient as a nurse. Um, but like I said, I can't tell why. All right guys, thank you so much for submitting all of your assumptions. Hopefully this gave you a little better idea of what being an FNP is and kind of does and some cleared up some assumptions you might have about it, whether they're true or false. If you wanna participate in polls like this in the future, make sure to head over to Instagram and add me. That's where I usually have all of these questions and everything. I also post what I'm seeing every day at work and what I'm learning from it. And if videos like this were fun and you'd like to see some more, I do content videos on nursing and NP related things on Tuesdays and have a weekly vlog on Saturday documenting my life as a family nurse practitioner. So if you're into that, consider subscribing down below. I would love to have you. Question of the day is what is something that people always assume about you that is just like so false? Like everyone thinks I'm short. I don't know why I'm 5'10", um, but everyone always thinks I'm short. So leave a funny assumption about you or one that just like makes you giggle down below that is totally false. Excited to look them over and I'll see you next time. Bye.